it's pretty cool, like Lewis, that we can even have this conversation to all of you really, because how many coaches are still coaching from our internship or just who even started five, six years ago, right? And, and it can make a living, can help a lot of people and still actually want to do it. And I wonder why is that? Like, there's a lot of factors. Why do you guys think there is such a high, what is the word, recidivism, like the high turnover rate in this industry? And like, how many coaches do you know that have been in the industry for like 10, 15 years? How many personal trainers do you know that are like multi-decade? Like, it's not a profession that really gets the respect. Oh, you're a personal trainer? Oh, you probably won't be that in like 10 years. Oh, you probably don't make a lot of money. Oh, you're probably not very successful. All these like stereotypes. How do you guys like think about all that and why that is? Uh, uh, yeah, can you go, I reckon, I reckon there's, there's so many people that get flushed out of university. I think there's a lot of intake and I think there's, there's very little jobs that appeal to the eye for most people that come out of university. And I mean, you know, in, within sport, and that's where everyone wants to work. The chances are very, very slim to find um, a good paying job that's not voluntary. Um, and then most people don't really look too much into semi-professional level, even though I think it's a great way to start up because you have full control of the systems and principles that you want to implement into a program. So I just think, I think there's a lot of, intake very little um, working opportunities um, and I think people just really focus on the sports side of, of SNC where there is this, such a big demand elsewhere in terms of general population and um, you know special um, interest areas but I think that's that's probably the thing for me that that, that solves that. Okay, so you think there's like there's a big emphasis on you got to get into elite sport, pro sport, um, and when people don't realize that vision and dream, then they kind of give up. Yeah, essentially, or they just like you know what, I'm going to do physio, or mm. I'm going to do osteo, or I'm going to do okay. something else. A more secure pathway. Correct. Yeah. Okay. What about you, Lewis? Uh, well, there's the first point, which is always going to ring true. You get thousands of graduates every year, but there's no there's no jobs. That's the maths doesn't add up. You can't just have thousands of people graduating every year and then expect them to be employed by realistically uh, a sports club or a private facility. They're the two main the two main ways to be employed in the industry as a strength and conditioning coach. So, um, for starters, there's not unlimited amounts of clubs, and there's also not unlimited amounts of private facilities to, to work out of a workforce. So essentially it's going to come down to the individual and them wanting to go out and work for themselves because you can find work on your own anywhere. You don't need to be under a brand. You don't need to be associated to a club. You can still find work. So I think it comes down to the individual wanting to just have an easier way to begin earning money, which is by being employed and gaining pay through an employer. Whereas the reality is you're probably going to have to start out by making your own way, making your own client base, building your own small business and then and trying to increase your income from there. And that's a lot of work outside of what you spend three to four years studying for. So there's an added layer of strength conditioning or private coaching that you probably don't hear about at all until you start doing it yourself. So that would scare people off too. I'm pretty interested in talking about that. Um, I think I'm not sure about what you've done, George, in regards to working for yourself or if you've always worked for a clinic or a sporting team, but maybe you just have some thoughts anyway. But Lewis, particularly because you have you have done that, self-employed, run your own business and worked for others, right? Which is quite similar to me actually, which is really cool and interesting. But for the early personal trainers, you know, I just we just finished an intake, right? Another intake just graduated and they're, they're personal trainers who are like, all right, they're going to enter the industry now. Like, what do you tell them? What do you guys tell them um, in how to actually get that client base? How to first, you know, establish their business, get and acquire clients and then keep them. 
Well, I think I think for me, it's um, I think it's a conversation that's been had many times um, with other leaders in the industry that will tell you it's it's not about who you're working with. It's not about the clientele because anyone can be coached, anyone can be trained, um, and you already have in your life pre-existing relationships with people, friends, family, friends of friends, family of friends. There's already so many connections that are tied to you that you could potentially pursue in terms of developing a client base. It doesn't have to be uh, the the guy who plays footy for a, for a decent level football club that lives you know near your gym, for example. It doesn't have to be that at all. It could be the person who you see every morning that goes into the gym at 6 a.m. but doesn't really know what they're doing. Well, there you go. There's there's a client that you could potentially add to your client base because they need your help just as much as someone who is playing sport at a high level, essentially. So don't just, um, I guess, pick and choose who you want to work with. Um, everyone has something that they can develop and work on. And um, as someone starting out, the best thing you can do is just work with anyone and everyone and try to develop skills, working with different people, different sports, different age groups, different conditions, different injuries, all sorts of things to just really get your hands dirty, expose yourself to what might happen in the training process with these different populations and then learn from the process and repeat, just rinse and repeat until you develop real confidence in your skills as a trainer. I think that advice saying yes to everybody is pretty big because it's easy to get selective. It's like, oh, I want to work with this population. I prefer to work with this person. But uh, that's actually very similar suggestions and guidelines and advice that I give to the Cert 34 students of ours. Um, what do you think, George? Uh, I completely agree with Phyllis. I think the, the more exposure to different populations and different uh, environments, the better you get as a coach or as a trainer or whatever you want to call it or in any sort of field you're working in. Um, because I think that's where you learn the most, obviously, on the job. You know, you can do all these courses, but if you're not exposed or, you know, you don't build experience, you're going to really struggle to be able to coach. Um, and that's, I think that's where I've learned the most. So, you know, if you have a really big interest in soccer, go out to a soccer club and see what they do. If you have some interest in athletics, go down. You know, people are pretty open to, to letting you in and giving you advice and even just watching it because you can pick up so many little things and so many little cues that you can implement in your coaching. Um, so just adding to your toolbox. But I think word of mouth is also really important. I think if you, um, you know, as you get more experience and you become better at what you do, I think people start to talk. And when someone has a really good um, experience with you, I think they're going to tell their friends, they're going to tell their families, and then that's sort of how you build um, a network. How did you guys do it? I mean, we're talking theory, right? But like sometimes the theory can be different from the story. Like, I'll go back to Lewis. Like, how did you get your first clients and establish your business, Lewis? And would you do it differently? Are you like, damn, that was stupid? Or like, that was really smart? Um, look, I think, I think firstly, I was probably – um, a bit different in the way I started because I um, the first time I coached was during the practical components of my undergrad degree so and it was completely foreign to me coaching like showing people how to do things and um, giving them feedback and watching them develop and get better over time so I didn't really get exposed to it properly until probably after my degree which is one thing that I regret, I probably should have gotten stuck in second, first year straight away and just really immerse myself in it. But at the same time, I wasn't entirely educated myself and I didn't realise if that was the best thing to do. So I didn't get into it earlier, which I wish I did. So um, probably first year out of uni is when I really started and um, I wasn't working for a gym at the time. I wasn't working for anyone at the time. I was doing work completely unrelated and I was actually called by a friend who was working at a soccer club and said, this is, you know, this is the club that I'm working for. I've just got a, an assistant coaching gig. Um, we're looking for someone to try and implement some sports science stuff. And we know you've done your degree because, you know, you know, we know each other. Why don't you come down and give it a try? And I was like, yeah, why not? So that's how I got involved in coaching. And probably would never start with working with a team straight up. You probably want to 
learn how to coach properly in a bit more of a controlled one-to-one environment first. Um, so that was one thing I probably regret a little bit. So before you get into all these SNC based roles where you're coaching the whole team, try to do some personal training, try to do some one-to-one stuff where you can really understand some of the issues or some of the common things that you're going to see with people when you're training them. And once you sort of uh, find some of those things, you can then branch off and start to apply for these, you know, SNC roles with sub elite clubs or academies or private facilities. Um, and then basically I just built from there. After starting with the soccer club, uh, that's when I started the, the Woodford internship. So they were alongside each other. So I was definitely coaching a lot at that time. Uh, team sport and private facility. So client base has started to build from there. Then I moved into um, a gym as a gym employee, a gym instructor. And then again, I'm working on the gym floor, not with actual private clients, but the members of the gym and assisting them through their program. So I didn't really have what I would say um, an amazing client base that was bringing in lots of money early on. It was really all about putting myself into situations where I could develop, apply, review my practices and repeat the process and try to get better. Um, and once I was comfortable with my own skill set, which was probably a few years down the track, that's when I started to go more into the private training side of things and build a client base with the people that I that I met along all of these different um, environments, soccer club, gym environment, and everywhere else, would fit internships and so on and so forth. So, yeah, I guess I'm a little bit different in the fact that I didn't go straight into a private business or a private sort of setup where I was trying to develop a base straight away. I sort of... I don't know, maybe I'm a bit of a perfectionist, but I was trying to actually develop my own skill set before I started to offer my services to, to people. And then it grew from there. Okay. I think there's something to be learned there that some people can emulate. What about you, George? You come from the like physiotherapy realm, but you're also S and C, so Yeah. So I, I got pretty lucky in the sense that um, I was in the private sector from, from the beginning. Um, I did some work at Melbourne City initially, like a sports trainer. Um, and like, like I said, I just literally wanted to see how everyone did everything. I was all eyes all the time. Um, and then playing soccer myself, I met obviously so many people along the years, like 20, almost 24, 25 years, close to 20 years now um, playing. So you meet heaps of people and then you see one person and then it's just word of mouth. Um, but for me, also being in the gym and training and then meeting people whilst you're training and then other coaches and then it just sort of you just it builds it builds and it builds pretty quickly um and you know i think having that sort of base where i'm you know i'm at a clinic and people sort of know where you are it's a little bit easier to get in touch and to find out who you are and what you're doing just jump on the website it's you know you got your profile um so in that sense for me, it was a little bit easier than probably, I guess, Lewis's journey into having to make or create his own sort of clientele. Um, and then obviously with marketing and that sort of stuff, that, that, that also helps. Um, me and Lewis also started a football performance program over the preseason, which was interesting because we hadn't really looked at that side of, I guess, the business side of it before. But um, again, it was... We just started with maybe five or six and then all of a sudden there was 15, 20 and then it just kind of started How did that growing. happen? How did it go from the all of a sudden 15, 20? What did you guys do? I don't know. I think people were just having fun and they were enjoying what we we're doing and, you know, just started talking to each other and we said we actually, yeah, a lot of footage was taken as well. So there was time put into, you know, Instagram and Facebook and that sort of stuff mm-hmm. um, and just, I guess, hyping it up a little bit, which, which – you know, most people don't think they have to do, but it becomes almost like a full-time job. Um, and it's hard. It's really hard, but I think that's what works really well for us. Yeah, I might, I might add to that. Um, even, even though I'm sort of fairly active on my social media and all that sort of thing, um, most of the contact that I get through my social media tends to be from other coaches or other people chatting about my posts and discussing things with me. It's not too many that I get that are people looking for sessions or training or um, looking to to get in contact with me to train and do things like that. So that was interesting. But 
same thing that George said with the word of mouth thing. I think if you can get um, and really focus on the person in front of you and get the best out of them and get do the right thing by them day in, day out, week in, week out, and they're seeing results and they're enjoying it and they feel the genuine care that you're, you're putting into your training with them, then that's that's half of the marketing done because that, that person's going to go home and tell their mum, their brother, their sister, their family, friends, their friends who play sport that are similar, that, look, I'm seeing this trainer and this is the type of stuff that they're doing for me. I've gone from, you know, X to Z in, in, this, in this period of time and it's been amazing. And then all of a sudden it just builds because people will talk about what they've experienced. And if it's a good experience, then the ball will just keep rolling. And I think that's exactly what happened with the football program. It was it was really a matter of people not understanding what it was at the start. But once um, once we started getting a little bit of vision out and once we started, I guess, slowly getting a couple more people coming to it, then they would speak to their teammates and their teammates would speak to their, to their brothers and sisters and their brothers and sisters would speak to their teammates of different age groups. Then all of a sudden you've got, like we spoke about, just a full, a full schedule. So, um, yeah, I think focusing on what you're doing in the sessions um, if you're doing a good job and if you're doing it consistently and you're offering that service consistent, consistently, then over time it's going to build through no extra work of your own, I guess. Mm. That makes me think, what qualities do you two think, what characteristics and qualities do you two think make up a great coach to enable you to actually reap the rewards and be successful and effective within your sessions a good coach a good physiotherapist a good health professional what characteristics do you guys think are the most common amongst the successful and the ones they're also the, the ones people make mistakes on like the big mistakes as well i think a big mistake is getting getting i might let george start with this one and i'll add, and I'll add to it so go ahead yeah. yeah i think i think communication is probably my biggest thing in coaching i think when i'll just use lewis as an example so we brought him into the club the senior boys just started to meet him um and then from almost day dot you know because he's quite you know he's, he's he looks like in essence he's big like and he's pretty scary and the boys you know we're a bit like uh oh, you know who's this guy but then from day dot he sort of he has this i guess charisma and he can get his message across. And from there, they were like, okay, well, this guy this guy knows what he's doing. He knows what he's talking about. And then being able to demonstrate, I think that's huge as well, being able to demonstrate the exercise and, you know, sometimes, you know, we'll go for a run and I'm still playing and Lewis isn't, but he'll outrun me. And I'm like, oh, well, okay, this, guy's, this guy knows what he's, you know, he's serious. He walks the walk. So he walks the walk. He doesn't just talk yeah, the talk, right? We've exactly. got a lot of people who would just talk and talk. Exactly. Um, so for me, they're probably the two biggest in terms of that coaching and what, what I sort of want from my coach anyway. I want to pause there. Uh, c communication, you, you said, George. Lewis, how do you think you're an effective, good communicator? Um, I think... I think because I make sure I get everyone's attention before I start speaking. How do you do uh, that? That's, that's a really thing. good point. How do you do that? Um, I just use I just use a stern voice and I say, "All right, listen up." And I'll wait around until everyone looks at me. Mm -hmm. And if no one's looking at me, I'll keep waiting. And then I'll say it again. All right, listen up. And if it keeps going, then I'll you know I'll be that coach that's like, "Oi, I cut it out. I'm talking now. Listen." And then when people sort of jerry that I'm not mucking around. So I'll flip that switch from sort of having a laugh and joking and having some banter with the boys to then listen up. It's time for me to talk and for you to listen. That's how I sort of get the attention. Once I've got the attention, it's, I guess, the guys know that, you know, they better focus and just listen for the next couple of minutes. Um, and I think the key is not talking for too long, just sort of getting the message across that you have to get, off, get across in a very succinct way. Yeah. But only once you have everyone's attention. Once that's done, then you can get on with, whatever's to come next in the session. So that's that's my biggest thing for in terms of talking in front of a group and getting them to listen to me while I'm talking. Um, in terms of just communication, I guess, one-on-one uh, -on -one settings, completely different, again, because people like to be spoken to in different ways. 
in a one-on-one setting. Um, some people like that similar sort of style where you're sort of, you're a bit more in charge and authoritative and you're telling them, listen up, this is what we're doing. Some people like it um, a little bit more subtle. And, you know, you're talking to them in a softer way. You're, you're just easing the message across. You're not being really sort of um, direct with it. Um, it just depends on the person, I guess. But, yeah, for communication-wise, yeah, get everyone's attention before you start blabbing on about stuff because it's going to go in one ear and out the other otherwise. That's great advice. Um, it's very simple. But I think it's a common mistake early coaches and health professionals make is, and I think the concise thing is so good because we have so much information in our head, right? And we get excited. We want to share it. I think we've all been there where we've over-talked, over-spilled. And it's a uh, hard lesson learned. But once you learn it, you learn to be more concise. Absolutely. But Lewis, you were mentioning you were going to start with a common mistake you see with personal trainers, talking characteristics. Yeah, okay. Definitely um, in terms of trying to get, I guess a mistake that you see early on is trying to completely maximize your your earning from the get-go. Trying to get as much as you can out of every personal training session that you do in terms of money. Um, yeah, that might be a good idea in terms of, you know, per hour I'm making more money, that means I can work less, um, so on and so forth. But at the same time, um, if you're doing that early on and you're not as good as you think you are, um, it's going to be a little bit more negative word of mouth being spread in terms of, uh, look, I went to this guy and he was all right, he was a decent coach, but like he charged me this much for a session, like I can't keep up with that. Like it's just, the value is just not there for me. So the advice or the thought process I'm going through there is take a bit of a short-term hit, short-term short term loss, I guess, and charge a bit less, maybe get a couple of people in. I know you hear it in the industry all the time, charge what you're worth, so on and so forth. But if you're starting out, yeah, you you're don't not even know anything. what you're worth. You're not worth anything yet. You've got to earn the right to be worth that. So, right. so take it easy, charge a fair price, charge something that you'd be happy to pay for your services. And then from there, if you can really dial it in, and you can give these people an amazing service, that's when you can start to, to charge what you're worth, I think. Do you have a, do you guys have values in mind of how a coach, because it's always the, the question and the topic we finish up on is business development and systems, and that question comes up. That's a topic we cover. How much should a personal trainer charge relative to their experience? And for you guys starting out, how does one answer that question in your opinion, in both of your opinions? I'll go, I'll go. I think um, I heard, I've seen a little bit of um, Grant Jenkins online and he, he mentioned something where he was a personal trainer at a gym, private gym, and the rule in the gym, the house rule was a dollar a minute is the minimum rate. So $60 an hour, you can't charge any less than that. That's, that's the rate that you're going for. So um, I think setting like a, a bit of a rule like that, which is it's not a crazy amount to pay for, for a one-hour personal training session. Um, for sure, it's not, not expensive at all. But um, it's also well above, say, a gym instructor, gym floor rate or um, any other sort of part-time rate that you might get. So I think it's a fair rate, but it's something that as you develop as a coach and you see more of the industry, you'll understand that you can, if you are worth it, you can charge much more in the future but as a starting point i would say it's fair to charge that because you're not going to be doing a crazy amount of sessions per week for starters but at the same time you're providing a level of service that's a bit more than say um, a part-time role where you're just on the gym floor supervising um, making sure nobody's getting hurt making sure members are safe all that sort of thing you're actually a bit more hands-on and you're, you've got someone's training and someone's body i guess you know, in your hands, essentially. So um, 60 an hour is a fair place to start and then keep building your, your knowledge, your skills and your practical your practical application from there and then, then start to increase that price as you go along. Okay. Do you have any thoughts on that, George? Um, I mean, it's a little bit different, I guess, coming from a physio background, but very similar. I think you have to sort of respect your time as well. A lot of the times you 
you know, if it can be easy to go like, you know, you're my friend, I'm just going to, we'll just give you a discount or we'll give you free. But a lot of times that, you know, you got to keep everything pretty straightforward. Otherwise, everyone's going to want to vouch, everyone wants a discount, everyone wants yeah. to be treated like the other guy. So I think if you can... The dangerous keep, precedent. Yeah, you got to keep it pretty stable from the get-go because otherwise, you know, people do start talking about, well, you know, he's charging me 60, why is he charging me 70 or, you know, that sort of stuff. So, but I think I think around a dollar and a minute sort of doesn't sound too bad, you know, from that sort of PT um, point of view. Um, I think nowadays, you know, with a standard consultation to see a physio, you're looking at something around, you know, 99 to $100. dollars um, So, and I think, you know, we could go into a much bigger discussion in, in terms of, you know, how long should the consultation be going for um, and that sort of stuff. But I think it was just way beyond this podcast. Well, if it's important, we can talk about it. Is that an important, is that like something that you care about, George? Is that like something pretty topical for you? Look, I think, I think, I think it is because I think, I think the, the physio profession as a whole is starting to slowly, slowly move into more, of an SNC type um, industry. So I think uh, it's, it's really hard because you see how much an SNC coach will go through in terms of study because um, you're pretty much doing, you're doing a degree, right? Um, a lot of the times um, in exercise science or you might just be coming out from an internship, but you're putting in time to study. And um, a lot of these, these days there's, courses that physios do it'll be like a one day snc course and all of a sudden they're an snc coach as well so i think they're it's a little bit flawed um and i think you know in 20 minutes you can't or 20 and 30 minutes you can't do you can't coach someone in that in that period um and i think that's where there's a there's a big gap in the industry um and then also because of that fee you can't be seeing someone, you know, twice a week. So a lot of the times, you know, that's that's what we need to do to, to get change or elicit change um, with people, but it becomes unaffordable. So, um, you know, if there's there's a lot of places that look at gym membership or memberships to, you know, the private, um, you know, private places, so they might pay, you know, $60, $70 a week and they'll get two, three sessions a week. I think that's a better way to get more out of a coach and more out of, you know, for the actual individual. Is that, so is that something when you see clients, like how do you bridge that gap? Are you coaching them as well as doing their physiotherapy? Um, yeah. So a lot of the times it's, it's, it is a crossover. It becomes a massive crossover. So, you know, if a patient is, you know, in the acute phase, um, and there's some manual therapy involved and then they're going to move into from day dot, they'll have some form of exercise. But I think, you know, 30, 40 minutes is, is required to get both done at, at a minimum. Um, so, you know, if you're coming in for a 10, 15 minute consultation, I'd be, I'd be questioning what's happening. Well, often even, you know, 168 hours in a week, you might see a client one, two, maybe three hours. Even still, that's minimal, it, particularly if the rest of their hours are not congruent with the habits you're trying to set up in that session. So then how do you two, you know, physiotherapy especially because early stage rehab, you're not going to see them long term, right? You don't want to see them long term, even though monetarily would be viable, but you want them to see them better. Like you want to solve their problems. So how do you guys think about regulating your clients outside of the time that you see them in person? Yeah. So for me, I spend a lot of, it's a lot of email interaction. You know, they've got their programs that they can access outside of the clinic. It's all um, video based, you know, they've got sets, reps, low tempo etc but it's all accessible outside of the hours that you're there so because you you yeah exactly what you said you want to give them as much as they can to do because you want to see them get better quick um so if they have any issues you know, 
pretty openly contactable, so which is not a good thing sometimes, but I think to get the best outcomes, I have to do that. So that's 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 what I do. Okay. Lewis? Yeah, very similar. Obviously, if I'm training somebody and they're, they might be a, a weekly client, um, two times a week client or once a month client, they're all going to have programs. So that's not going to change. So the fact that they can implement those programs outside of our, of our time together, um, it's exactly the same concept. So you give them a program to do, you check in to see if they're doing it, and then you, you judge their, their, first of all, how they've executed the program. Have they done it properly? Are they getting issues with it? Are they getting sore? Are they getting, you know, is it too easy? Is it too hard? All these sorts of things. And then you go about modifying it from there if it's a different sort of session to what you would do normally with them. Do you have a system? Do you two have systems set up that clients, you can see all those answers to those questions on a weekly basis? Or is that just a Q&A, you just message them back and forth? Or do you have like spreadsheets or like some type of way they input data? Yeah, well, I've got, I've got spreadsheets and all the like, but not everyone likes to use them. So sometimes you're really proud of something and, you know, this could be great. You could use this for online coaching and um, even your normal, normal face-to-face clientele. And they can just pop in their weights as they go along and they can just tick off the sets and reps. And then um, it might happen for week one or two. And then it's just, it will never happen again. It just stops, it dies off. It's just um, something that gets put on the back burner because once that person knows their session, they don't even open their phone to look at what what needs to be done. They just sort of go with the flow sometimes. Um, So yeah, it's really a matter of touching base with them frequently instead and doing it the old fashioned way, which is how'd you go, what weights to lift, how many reps you get up to, et cetera, et cetera, depending on the programs. Because, yeah, your program's not going to be set in stone all the time. You're going to give them a guide for what they're going to do. Yeah. And they're not always going to just go out and like, all right, I have to do five by five at 120 kilos. Like, that's, it's just such an arbitrary number that it's, why do they have to do that? that? That might not be conducive to, you know, what they're doing outside of the gym at that point in time. So do they have to do it? Yeah, it might get them stronger, but it's probably not the best thing for them to do right now. So... Um, touching base with people and being more aware of what they're doing outside of the gym in addition to training is probably a better thing for me to know than to know that they ticked off a five by five session. Right. And to backtrack a little bit, George, I wanted to ask you, like we're talking characteristics of coaches with physiotherapists. What do you think are some of the most common characteristics of a great physiotherapist and common flaws? Um, good question. I think one of the great characteristics would be being able to listen to what the patient is saying Mm. and let them, because they'll tell you the story and that story will pretty much give you a diagnosis before you even assess them. Um, so for me, I learned that pretty early, but just let the patient talk and then just sort of leave them with very, very small words or sentences on where you sort of want to get the direction so it doesn't become they don't go on tangents and they stay within where you're trying to where you're trying to go but i think listening is really important um i think the diagnosis by physios is quite good i think the treatment um late stages need some work i think that end stage rehab definitely needs some work because i think Gone are the days where, you know, they're manual muscle testing with, you know, just with your hands and your, you know, they've got five out of five hamstring strengths. Okay, they, they're good to go back after a hamstring injury. But it doesn't work that way. Um, I think there, there needs to be more involvement from SNC. I think there should be a referral system where, you know, the physio does the acute, subacute phase and then when it's time to sort of return to sport, you're not just thrown back into your team. You know, you, you, you see an SNC um, and then they get you doing some field-based work and then from there you're moving into back into the, the, the team environment. So how, how do you two bridge the gap? How do you two bridge the gap between your professions? How do we come together, communicate effectively for the betterment of the athlete or client? I think... I think there's a there's definitely an ego 
thing. There's there's an ego thing. So, and there's a financial thing. So I think as a physiotherapist, I can see that I'd want to try and keep the patient under my care and not hand him over to someone else. But really, if you, if I say, if I'm seeing this patient and I need to, I can't do the rest of it anymore because I can't get out on the field. I'll be like, look, Lewis, this is so-and-so. They've had a hamstring injury. They're currently doing this, this, and this. They want to return to soccer. What can we do? Um, so there's a crossover. So I'm still managing them, but they are now seeing the SNC coach and he's bridging the gap into to, to returning to sport. Lewis? Yeah, exactly as George said. It's a collaboration. If you find yourself um, as a coach, if you can find yourself or align yourself with a physio, not only are you going to get lots of, and they can trust you, obviously, and you have a good understanding of how each other work, you're going to have um, a lot more referrals of people returning from injury, um, whether that's you know soft tissue, minor minor procedure, um, you know surgery, ligament surgeries, things like that. Um, if you can have uh, a good relationship with a physio and, and and have this understanding that you understand the process of slow cooking someone who's gone through a period of inactivity, injury, surgery, into then slowly building them up to the demands of the game, the sport, whatever it is that they do. Um, and you can constantly communicate what they're doing back and forth um, so that you're not essentially missing out on anything. You're both having eyes over the program then that's when you can start to see, I guess, um, a really good system where you can hand over from one to the next. So, um, and vice versa, if you're training your own clientele and they do an injury, well, you're returning the favour to the physio now. So you have this two-way relationship where the physio can refer clients to you because they know you can get them ready for what they're trying to be prepared for. And you also know that if your client gets hurt doing what they love to do, then you know a physio that knows how to, manage them in the acute phase of their injury and then the cycle could just continue in that fashion. So it's not about, you know, I, I know my place. I, I'm not going to worry about acute phase rehab, um, you know, mobility-based treatment, uh, exercise and manual therapy. I'm not even going to bother with that stuff because that's not what I do. But if they can run and they're cleared to run and they've got significant, um, a significant amount of strength back in the injured limb, injured muscle, injured whatever it is, and... My physio that I'm working with tells me that they're good to go with these sessions, then I have full confidence that I can start with the gradual progressions and build them up to where they need to be just by just by applying common sense and progressive overload. So okay. I think that's how you should be working together. Um, find yourself someone who you can get on the same page with, have a good relationship with and, and work together with for a longer period of time. And that's what you guys have. You yep. guys have that, which is no doubt. Like working together at uh, Brunswick City, I wonder how do you guys test your athletes? I actually just finished a session earlier and we were doing some max testing on a prowler and uh, some speed testing. And I wonder that it's very top, it's very um, top of mind for me. So I wonder with your athletes, you got a lot, you guys got big groups. What metrics tests are you guys looking to test frequently? Why? And yeah, and would those be the ones you'd recommend to people or are they unique to your situation? Do you want to touch on the um, the, the screen that we did pre-season, George? Or? Yeah, we'll start with that. Um, so basically, during the pre-season, we, we tested pretty much every player. We looked at, I think the, the first thing I would want to, I want to say is that you... As SNC coaches or physios, we try. We think that getting all this data is good, but I don't think it's good if you're not going to use it. Mm. So I think that's that's probably the, the first thing I'd want to make clear. But for us, we wanted to look at you know what are the most common injuries in soccer. So we're looking around the hip and groin. We're looking at knees. We're looking at soft tissue, hamstring. Um, quads and then we're looking at you know the ankles um, and calves so we did pretty much a, a basic screen looking at hamstring um, flexibility hamstring strength we did that with a handheld dy dyno 
Um, we looked at uh, groin squeeze. We looked at um, knee flexion extension just in case we had a knee injury and we needed a baseline measure. Um, and then we looked at, uh, I think, a single leg calf raise um, and knee to wall. So they were pretty much the initial screens. And then obviously if any injuries occurred or have occurred throughout the this season we've got a baseline measure of what we need to get to we also looked at some power um, movements so lewis took the broad jumps a double leg broad jump and then for symmetry we looked at a single leg broad jump left and right um yeah those were the main, main tests that we did at brunswick so going on from that i guess um you can see there's not there's no real strength testing in there. So we just got some basic muscle strength tests. And that's because uh, the training age of some of the athletes in terms of the gym is just, it's not feasible to do strength testing with some of the guys. So yeah, they might play soccer at a pretty decent level. And there's some, some exceptional athletes in that team that can run really fast and run a lot. Mm. But strength training was not their uh, specialty, let's say. So you don't want to throw them into a max strength test early on. Um, when there's no need to, and there's just no need to do that. So we didn't look at any strength tests, but the muscle strength testing is enough of an indication for us if they're getting fatigued, if they're um, feeling, you know, somewhat um, different to normal in those muscle groups. So they're the important muscle groups that we looked at. But the, the broad jumps and the single leg jumps and stuff, that's probably the test that we'll do every now and then. So... Did once in pre-season, again in pre-season. We're probably going to do it again in a couple of weeks when the season starts. And we'll continue to do that throughout the season to identify if there are any drop-offs in power because essentially that's that's the sport. Power and conditioning and fitness and speed and repeat efforts, they don't need to be too strong, although it helps with reducing injuries. But at the same time, we've got a program in place that touches on all that stuff um, without having to use too much external resistance. So, you know, max speed, sprinting once a week minimum um nordic exercises hip um hip isos all these sorts of different exercises that you can do that strengthen the muscle in specific positions um but not actually using general snc based exercises like your squats and your deadlifts at the club per se there is a program that the players have access to that they can do that outside and they have a, a calendar and they know which days they should be doing it on and the weights that they need to be lifting and all that sort of thing but it's it's very common that players will not do that. So we have to put in place these, these measures to stop them from, not to stop them, but to account for them not doing the weight training um, away from the club. So um, that's always a challenge in soccer. It always has been, but it's one that I think I'm a little bit more used to now and I know how to manage a bit more. Um, and you can definitely see that the guys are getting fitter, stronger, faster without doing too much weight training in the gym anyway. So um, that's the main thing. Um, I think I'll touch on something else that we did. We do a lot of work with the juniors at the club as well, and we did a similar screening for all the juniors. Um, and that program, um, we do a bunch of tests, very similar to the, to the senior squad, but a couple of extra things in there, like landing mechanics, um, things like, um, yeah, groin, the same groin squeeze and hamstring squeeze test and, and mo active, active mobility in the hamstrings and things like that, because we can then actually rate that and score it and then give the guys a program to do before training, the days between training sessions to try and actually get them to improve on that. And then when we do test again, which is there's another testing date coming up soon, we can see the change, whether it's good or bad. And then from that, the coach can then enforce, all right, well, we started here, we've ended up here, good job for sticking to the program or it's not good enough, we've gone backwards or what's going on, why is it that we're not improving these areas. We've done a test, we've been given a program that's going to help us to do, to improve these metrics, but why are we not improving? So essentially it's that, that saying of what gets measured gets managed, but at the same time, you can measure everything. It doesn't mean it's meaningful. So you have to pick the right things to measure, um, things that are relatable to the people that you're working with and measure them um, the appropriate amount of times instead of doing it, say, every single session, every single week, you know, once a year, you have to do them uh, an appropriate sort of um, time frame away from each other. Enough that you can see change, but not too far apart that 
you know, the program can slip through the cracks, so to speak. So I think that's probably the main way we like to collect and use data um, in terms of testing. That's great. What what about then for, because we've covered athletic development, what about for the average client, the, the, the non-athlete, the, I don't know, the general human athlete? How, yep. What do you guys, how do you guys think about testing them and what's important for them? Well, I think when I'm working with um, private clients, uh, depending on their goals, obviously, you, it's going to determine what you're going to be testing, right? So if I've got someone who's, um, you know, is a goalkeeper, he wants to develop his, his power and his acceleration, um, I'm going to test those things specifically. But if I'm working with someone who uh, wants to get stronger and, and lose weight and be more athletic and fit just in general, then I'm probably not going to test those things. I'm probably really going to start with the things that matter to them more, which is where do you start today in terms of your body composition, um, what numbers are you starting on in terms of your basic strength lifts, and if we're doing some type of gym-based conditioning, a baseline of your, your gym-based conditioning, whether that's a, you know, a time trial test on a treadmill, bike, rower. So keep it simple but in line with the person's goals, essentially. Okay. George? Yeah, very, very similar to Lewis. I think, again, testing what's required to be tested. So just an ex as an example, if we had just, you know, let's just say someone that's coming with back pain, I'm going to look at, you know, is it is it a new thing at a straight leg raise? Is it something um, that's a strength issue? I'm going to look at um, hip, hip extensor strength, hip abduction strength. I'm going to look at, you know, lumbar extension, extension strength. And I've got access, luckily enough, to um, a, a handheld dyno. But there's a lot of different um, assessment tools coming out nowadays. Um, I know that Veld has some really good stuff in the force frame. I know that Axit has come out with a couple of different um, assessment tools to give you numbers. And I think people like to see numbers, particularly if they're seeing progress. And I think that's a really nice way to show them that the exercise programs that you're putting them on is actually sh making a change. Um, and it, it gives them buy in as well. And I think that's, that's really, really important because if, if I come in and I say, look, yeah, my, my pain's not improving um, and, and I can show them, okay, well, look, our strength hasn't really changed, then they can be like, oh, okay, maybe I'm going to continue to work on this and then if that gets better, I'm going to get better. Um, so I think that's, that's really important. Um, with people who don't have access to those sorts of things, I think just trying to keep it as simple as possible, you know, you can use things like a... As fig, so for a groin squeeze, it's really easy to purchase. They're pretty cheap. Um, goniometer, probably not used as much nowadays, but I think it's still pretty important to get actual numbers, um, particularly for something like a knee injury or a hip injury, because it still shows you that you're looking at, at things and you're, but again, it has to be used. If it's not used, then there's no point. And what was it? The... What was I gonna? I just want to pause. It'll, for a... you, man. It'll come to you. I just want to pause for a second because you said something that triggered. Well, before we finish, I'll touch on this. If you could, guys, and maybe it'll come to me. If you guys could go back to young George, young Lewis, the trainers just starting out, the health professionals, the physiotherapists just starting out. What do you guys tell them? Or even better, you have a podium for all the personal trainers and physiotherapists who are just graduated and they're ready to go. What's your speech? You got one, you got like two minutes, three minutes. What do you tell them? Wanna go? Yeah, I think I think the world is your oyster. I think you can make your job any way you want it to be. So you 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 have to create your own systems. You have to you have to do what you believe is going to work. And obviously, from in my field, it's got to be evidence based. Um, but there's so many things that you can do to make it 
your own. And I think that's that's probably the most important thing. I think you can watch people do things, you can take things from different people, but at the end of the day, make it your own and you will be very successful. On that, how do you make it your own? What does that mean to you? I think for me, being able to to say go to professional development and you know see people do different things and then put it all into one and make it my own i think that's that's what i mean by that so i'll give an example like you know alex natera's isometric stuff so i'll use heaps of that but i'll incorporate you know blocky wilmot's plyometric continuum um just using look watch people that are really good in the industry mm. and then use that to make your own sort of style right so you become a product of your environment which is a multitude of excellent professionals exactly exactly and then you become one exactly <laughs> lewis what's your, what's your little speech to the to the young graduates um, i think you have to make sure that you know you know your stuff and you put in the time to know your stuff. So first of all, the point that George made about making things your own, you can't make something your own if you don't understand how it works fundamentally. So having an understanding of how things work and the physiology behind training, the biomechanics behind training and exercise and sport, um, the demands of the sports that you're working with or the people that you're working with, if you don't have an understanding of all of that, then you can't make someone else's work, essentially. Um, you can't completely understand it and break it down and make it your own. So you have to know your stuff. So don't get lazy with that stuff. I, that's that's sort of how I started, I guess. I spent that those first few years of my, of my career not worrying about my, my client base and more worrying about do I know the stuff I need to know to get actual change in results. So know your stuff. Um, get out and coach at an earlier time. So like I said, I started too late. I would have started first or second year if I had my time again. I just didn't know. So to all those guys who are starting out now, definitely start as soon as you can. Go and coach anyone. Go and coach uh, the under 12s footy team at your local club or basketball team or netball team or go to an athletics track or a gymnastics club or wherever else you can go to, to coach. Go and do that. It doesn't have to be in the gym-based setting straight away. Um, and then, yeah, I think you need to, after a while, really know what you want to eventually do long term. So hash it out. What do you want to do? What do you want to be? And then put a plan in place for how you're going to get there one day and make it sustainable. Because if you are going to do something like strength conditioning and you want to make that a career, I can tell you right now, you're going to be doing lots of free work, lots of hours unnoticed, unpaid. Um, and that's all part of the process of you know, building the steps of your career to, to get onto bigger and better things if that's really what you want to do. So be prepared for a bit of unpaid work, um, but just don't treat it as unpaid work. You've got to treat that, that work that you're doing when you're starting out uh, as if you're, you know, you're working for the biggest organisation or club in the world because um, that's how you get to the next step. You keep doing the best where you're at um, and then you apply that to the next job and the next job and the next job. Um, so that's sort of how I... That's sort of the information or the advice I would give to, to younger people or a younger version of myself, for sure. That's so valuable from both of you and, and particularly treating the volunteer, the free experience, the internship with the respect that it deserves or, or with the respect, like you have the responsibility, like treat it with, the, with a high amount of... As if you're like taking responsibility for the program, as if you're getting paid and i think i think back to how we began you know early in those days and how we met at the woodford internship and i think that would probably be one thing that separated the people who got future opportunities like i was fortunate enough to become a coach there right and then you use that as a platform and as you did with other things to go off and do your own thing and i don't think that would have happened if we didn't turn up consistently and we didn't ask a lot of questions. And 
we didn't get there early and stay later and, and adopt behaviors that showed that we wanted to be there and really cared about being better. That's that's one thing I can definitely say I remember um, was you and I were probably the ones who put in that that extra work, man. We were we're a bit biased, there. aren't we? We were always hustling, though. I'm telling you, it was always us, and we knew that that's the stuff that you got to do, man. Early days, you got to put that work in, earn as much as you can, because those experiences don't come around very often, and the value that you can get out of them are priceless. And it ended up being priceless for me, like legitimately, the, some of the best experience that I gained because it was so early in my coaching career. Yeah. I was able to influence the way I go about things so much. Um, and it was like, it was that step that you needed to take, even though it was hard to, you know, to commit to sometimes an internship. Um, it was, yeah, it's something that, yeah, it, it would have completely changed where I am. Much, right if I didn't do it. much respect and credit to Woodford and those guys there forever. Yeah. Um, but I think, you know, for our words, like George, Lewis, you know, if I want to put myself in the mix, like the proof's in the pudding, right? Because we're st we're here. Like we're all here and able to be, not just survive, but, you know, thrive in our own way and be successful and be effective, which, you know, is arguably more important. But to finish off, guys, do you have any last parting comments, thoughts, words for the people and coaches and, and health professionals listening to finish off? Um, oh, look, there's a, there's a lot of things you can say, but I think um, it all comes down to how, how much do you want to help people? Um, do you care about the people that you're working with? Um, do you love what you do? Is it enjoyable for you? And the, the last thing I would say is there's no need to to overdo it at the same time. So, What do you mean by that? Um, yeah, so what I mean is don't overdo it in terms of... Uh, hours you're putting in sometimes keep the balance early on um, it's very easy it was very easy for me to get burnt out early days because i thought i've just got to coach 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 i've just got to get um surround myself in this environment you know saturate myself in this industry and just constantly be a part of it and be doing things that are involved in it and then get to a point where i've got no spare time to, to think breathe unpack everything that i've been doing so early days like try to have a little bit of a balance it doesn't have to be a crazy crazy amount of free time but give yourself some free time because that's definitely one thing i didn't do and i learned after a few months that it was not sustainable so yeah. um yeah give yourself some free time you know, you know you've earned it you're still you're still working hard you're still learning you're still developing you're not going to be where you want to be um long term in a couple of months it's going to take years so yeah, embrace the process george no, I completely agree. I think it's really important to get a work-life balance um, and continue learning as well. Just keep learning as much as you can. Um, like Lewis said, if you don't understand the fundamentals, it's very hard to apply it um, and get results from it because you can apply something that you see on, on Instagram or on social media, but if you don't understand why you're doing it or what you're trying to achieve from it, most of the times it's, it's, it's not going to work. Um, and I think that's, that's, that's a massive thing. So, you know, there, you see lots of stuff on social media, but I think you have to always question why you're doing something mm -hmm. um, and what you're trying to achieve. Um, and I think that's probably the biggest, the biggest take home for me. Thank you, boys. And i got to ask, Lewis, are you, on a, are you sitting on a Swiss ball? <laughs> no, I'm not. I'm on a desk chair. Desk chair. Desk chair, yeah. Does it bounce? No, no, I'm, I'm bouncing myself. I get I get the jitters sometimes, you know, I just gotta move. Uh, I'll tell you what it is. I'll tell get, you what it getting is. That I've had too much up. coffee and I'm ready for my I'm ready for my lower body gym session. Ooh. I'm gonna go and smash it out soon. Yes, yeah, son. Go get it. <laughs> All right. Boys, thank you so much for your time. Where where can people find you if they want to learn more? What are you guys putting out to the world that you're excited to share? Um, I'm on Instagram at Sports site underscore Lewis and um, LinkedIn as well. I post a bit on there, just my name, Lewis Mazza. Um, I'm posting stuff all the time about the people that I'm working with, um, my thoughts on 
specific principles and methods and training programs and just just little bits and pieces to do with physical performance and rehab. Um, so yeah, George, uh, I'm on mainly on social media, Instagram, um, LinkedIn. Use it a fair bit, but not, not too much on the socials. Just uh, you can find me in the clinic, Brunswick Health, at the moment, and then obviously at the club. And I, I can drop my email if anyone wants to. You can find you in working, getting reps in, exactly. helping people. That's what we want. That's what we like. Catching up to me. <laughs> <laughs> Boys, thank you for your time. And I look forward to us crossing paths again in person in the near future. Pleasure, mate. All right. Yeah, that's a must, man. We'll definitely Absolutely. tear it up too. Absolutely. See you, boys. Thanks for your time. You're most welcome. All right, guys, we're back. All Fit Podcast is back. Number 36, Lewis and George. We're going to be back doing these every week. Not so much live anymore for now, but we will be doing, releasing them every week on all podcast platforms, YouTube, Facebook, everywhere you can find All Fit Education. Thank you guys for listening. And if you guys want... For those who don't know, we were going to have a new intake, and we just we just finished an intake of some sort from our social media, an intake of students who recently graduated from our Body Seek Williamstown intake, and we will be having a new intake very soon in about the middle of 2021 approximately. So if you guys want to join that, become a personal trainer and coach, and like the stuff you're hearing and we're wanting and sitting on the fence and been waiting... Then we might be a good fit for you. Check you can check us out on orphiceducation.com and see if some of our values resonate with you and we may be able to go down a similar path and help. Otherwise, I'm Alexander Emmanuel Sendas. You guys can find me all on the internet by searching me and uh, follow the, the coaching and training journey at Strength of Sard. Otherwise, I will see you guys next week.